The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, law, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Ted Shaw, the Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, newly designated to be the Director Counsel. Congratulations on that designation, Ted. Thank you. Now, tell us a little about the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Council. It is not the NAACP, although it started there. It is an independent advocacy civil rights law group. Uh, it is, and, and first I want to say how honored I am to be on your show, and we've talked before. You're my friend, and as we were talking about, and I want our viewers to know, my hero. So uh, I'm really very happy to be here. Well, one thing about the Tuskegee Airmen, everybody knows about us now, but the thing that's very interesting, actually, the Legal Defense and Education Fund, the NWC, had something to do with our being created because they participated in a suit by a guy named Yancey Williams to allow blacks to enter the Air Corps at that time. It didn't actually go into court, but because of that action, President Roosevelt, with the initiative of Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, created the 99th Pursuit Squadron, which was the first time African Americans were allowed to fly, and it began in April of 1941. Mm. And through that period, through 1945, the Tuskegee Airmen created this record of never losing a bomber we were escorting to enemy fighters, and we led the way for the integration of the armed forces, not just the Air Force. And you were the first pilot to ever shoot down a jet, so I uh, did so that among on, other things. I did that over Berlin, the longest mission of the 15th Air Force. But the main thing is the Tuskegee Airmen did so many other outstanding things. We were the only fighter group to blow up a destroyer. We were the only fighter group never to lose a bomber. We were the only fighter group to fly four different aircraft in combat. And with my friends, uh, the, my leader, Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., became the first black general, and then Lee Archer and Percy Sutton and Charles McGee. Uh, we have really made a contribution. We're very proud that folks like you recognize it. And we also know it wouldn't have happened without the pressure of African Americans all over this country. Well, I'm proud to be associated, affiliated with an organization that played that role, uh, given how proud I am to know you and of the Tuskegee Airmen and their story. And our viewers should all know about it. Uh, I was, I know we have to talk about the Legal Defense Fund, but as you know, <laughs> I talked to you about seeing uh, uh, one of the Tuskegee Airmen's planes, uh, Lee Archer's plane down in Florida, and seeing about you and reading your exploits. And so I said, you know, I know Roscoe Brown, Dr. Roscoe Brown, but you know, there's a lot I don't know about them, even with what I know. So uh, uh, we'll talk about that some we'll more. We'll talk about that. You know, the, the Legal Defense Fund, though, uh, you talk about those days. Uh, the Legal Defense Fund was created in 1940. So it was right before mm -hmm. uh, the start of World War II. And it was created by the NAACP under the direction of uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, the brain uh, child of of really Charles Houston. Charles Houston from Howard University Law School. That's right, the dean of Howard University Law School, the great architect of the legal civil rights movement, the mentor for Thurgood Marshall and so many other uh, others of the great civil rights lawyers uh, of the 40s and 50s. And without Charlie Houston, there would not have been a Brown versus Board of Education. And Thurgood Marshall wouldn't have been trained to go on and do what he did. And so uh, Charlie Houston, when he was the dean of Howard Law School, used to say that you're either a a lawyer is a social engineer or a parasite on society. And so he, he trained a generation of uh, great social engineers who changed America. The Legal Defense Fund was part of that. It was now created the theory, in 1940. The theory behind the Brown case was they were figuring out how to end school, uh, school segregation. And the theory that you and the LDF came up with was to challenge it on the grounds of the 14th Amendment. Is that correct? Well, that's right. Of course, you know, I... The 14th I, I, Amendment, which is uh, rights for all citizens. That's right. right. And, 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 of course, I mean, I wish that I was there at the time, but... <laughs> you were in school. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I wasn't even there yet. Uh, I was born in the year of Brown versus Board of Education, oh. and so it's... Uh, uh, 
uh, it's really a coincidence, but uh, I never knew what it was like to live in, a, in an America that was segregated by law without uh, any benefit of the protection of the Equal Protection Clause. The 14th Amendment was enacted in the aftermath of the Civil War and was enacted for the purpose of bringing the recently freed slaves to, to equality, to equal status with white people. So we had the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, which eliminated slavery, the 14th, that gave the full right to citizenship, and the 15th, which supposedly gave the right to vote. That's exactly right. Now, of course, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were honored more in the breach, uh, especially in the aftermath of Reconstruction and through the early part and till the middle of the, of the 20th century. Uh, there was no real meaningful right to vote for black folks in the South. But I do believe that the 13th Amendment was challenged in the Supreme Court. Was well, it not? Well, the, the, the authority mm -hmm. of Congress to act to pass legislation mm -hmm. uh, pursuant to the, uh, to the amendments was a uh, challenge mm -hmm. in the courts in the 1800s. And so in 1883, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court decided a case known as the Civil Rights Cases. And that's a mere 20 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery wasn't even cold in his grave. And in the uh, opinion which struck down the civil rights statutes, uh, that were passed and enacted, one of the justices wrote that there comes a time when the people who recently have been freed from the bondage of slavery need to stand up on their own two feet and cease trying to be the special favorites of the laws. So you think about that. That's the same arguments that That's we hear today. today you know, That's right, affirmative that, action. that black <laughs> folks are trying to be the special yeah. favorites of the laws. Uh, of course, the 14th Amendment, as I said, was uh, really bankrupted uh, during this time, and particularly by Plessy versus Ferguson mm -hmm. in 1896, which was a case involving segregation of railroad cars down in New Orleans, uh, but separate but equal was upheld as constitutional, and that became the basis for segregation throughout American society, Jim Crow as we knew it, mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't changed until Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation with respect to public education, at least, uh, was unconstitutional, that separate schools were inherently infer inferior, and it, they struck down uh, segregation in public school education. But there had been cases before then, going back, I think, to 1939, 1940, about law schools, where oh, yes. the Murray case in Maryland, where uh, blacks wanted to go to law school. There wasn't a law school, and I think it was Donald Murray or somebody. Donald who, Murray, that's right. Who was the first one who go to a law school. So little by little, they were chipping away at segregation. There were some transportation cases, and there were some uh, other kind of civil rights cases that that's right. set the stage for Brown v. Board. It was the most brilliant legal campaign in the history of the United States and maybe anywhere. Uh, I don't want to overstate the case, but I don't think that's overstating it. Uh, what the lawyers did, uh, Charlie Houston and then Thurgood Marshall, uh, joined by Oliver Hill, who's 97 years old, but still, still with us and still very much alert, uh, as well as uh, Connie Motley and, and Bob Carter. And uh, what, what wasn't Bill Coleman? Bill Coleman. Bill William Coleman, T. Coleman was a Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airman. Airman. He was my roommate right. in flying school. Oh, that's right. is that right? <laughs> yeah. You all were everywhere. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and joined by Jack Greenberg, who later succeeded Thurgood Marshall at the Legal Defense Fund. But they, they incrementally began to attack segregation. Uh, and uh, strategically, they went after colleges and universities first because they knew that the states could not make separate really equal. They couldn't have a separate dental school, a separate agricultural school, a separate law school, medical school. They didn't have the finances to do it. Uh, but by forcing these cases to a uh, resolution, it really showed that separate could not be equal, and these states had to open up their schools to African Americans. As you know, many of the southern states, probably all of them, would prefer in the few instances in which black folks uh, insisted on getting a college education, th they would send them out of state yeah. and pay their tuition to attend uh, a school up in the north somewhere or out west somewhere. 
When I was a professor at New York University in the School of Education during the summer, we used to have literally hundreds of black graduate students coming to NYU paid by mm -hmm. the southern states because they didn't want them to attend the uh, white universities. That changed around 1970, and I think a football player was probably instrumental in that. The University of Alabama, where they had turned away Austin and Lucy before, finally decided that they kept losing these games because their football players were going to the white universities up north, and finally they uh, gave a scholarship to Willard Jackson, University of Alabama, he later played with the 49ers, and Paul Bryan is reputed to have said, the faster that boy runs, the whiter he gets. <laughs> and that was <laughs> I've heard that quote. I've heard that <laughs> quote. But, you know, it, it, at the time, of course, there was so much uh, pressure uh, that was going on to desegregate in other ways, and the legal defense fund was involved in almost all of those cases. But it was interesting to see that in some instances, uh, self-interest, you know, mm -hmm. in, on the athletic field particularly led a lot of these institutions to begin to open their doors to people that they kept out before. Now, you know, here's the thing about the Legal Defense Fund that I really want to underscore. Uh, it has become, I think, one of the quintessential American institutions, even though it's an institution that uh, many people uh, feel uh, engages in litigation, which they find to be unpleasant, unpalatable, you know, they think it's divisive. But this is an institution uh, that, along with other institutions, but it played a central role, changed America. Uh, it, not only through Brown, but through the whole series of lawsuits before mm -hmm. Brown and after Brown. Uh, most of the major civil rights cases, certainly those involving African Americans, have been legal defense fund cases. The legal defense fund has now uh, litigated more cases in the United States Supreme Court, with the exception of the Justice Department the Solicitor General's office because they're on both sides of mm -hmm. cases and they're in court all the time. But other than that, the Legal Defense Fund has been there more often and at least as of, uh, I remember about 10 or 15 years ago, we could say that we had won more cases. I don't know if we could still say that. The courts have become very conservative, but that still may be true given how few really repeat performers there are in the Supreme Court. Did the Legal Defense Fund handle the uh, case against the death penalty? Uh, well, uh, the Legal Defense Fund handled the case that stopped the death penalty cold in the 1970s, mm -hmm. Furman versus Georgia, that knocked out the death penalty mm -hmm. until all the states had to come back and rewrite their death penalty statutes and uh, bring them into compliance of, with constitutional standards. Uh, there was a case last week decided by the Supreme Court out of Texas, Delmer Banks, uh, it was on death row, came within 10 minutes of being executed last August. Our lawyer at the time, George Kendall, who uh, is now with a private firm but working very closely with us, uh, he litigated that case. It was a legal defense fund case. And it still is a legal defense fund case because we're still trying to get relief for Delma Banks because there are serious questions of innocence. What we know about the death penalty goes way back to the days that you were talking about, the days when Thurgood Marshall was litigating mm -hmm. death penalty cases, that the death penalty has always been implemented in a racially discriminatory way. Uh, even aside from race, it's, it's been arbitrary. And I think by now, whatever Americans think about the deterrent effect of the death penalty, it's been proven that it really doesn't have much deterrent effect. It's mm -hmm. really revenge. But more importantly, we have all this evidence, uh, DNA evidence, of people who have been uh, exonerated, let off of death row over the last uh, 10 years or mm -hmm. so. Some people say, well, that shows you the system works. Well, no. Mm -hmm. It shows you that human beings are fallible. fallible and uh, I suspect that somewhere uh, there's somebody who's been executed who's been innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, and we certainly have the danger of that happening again. We don't catch all of our mistakes. And so I think for all kinds of reasons, the death penalty is something that we should move away from and come into uh, the enlightenment of the 21st century like the, almost the entire world. Uh, you know, people who commit murder and horrendous crimes, th they should be in jail. Uh, execution, though, you know, if you make a mistake, you can't bring them back. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of our, our agenda these days. Another part of our agenda with respect to criminal justice is uh, the, the way the so-called war on drugs has been played out. Mm -hmm. We had a case down in Tulia, Texas. Uh, we still are involved in that case, in the aftermath of that case, in which uh, a few years back, uh, early morning, pre-dawn raid, uh, 
about 10% of the black population of this tiny town uh, is arrested. And they're arraigned in their underclothes or their pajamas, uh, you know, and that's done intentionally to humiliate and embarrass them. The cameras are already there. They've been notified. They're all arrested and prosecuted, some of them convicted on the word of one mm -hmm. undercover policeman, a white policeman, who has federal drug task force money, uh, who has no evidence uh, other than what he said was some notes he wrote on his leg, on his calf or the pen. No money, no drugs, uh, no uh, nothing, you know, nothing recovered, uh, no weapons, nothing. Uh, and the first person who was uh, prosecuted, 66-year-old hog farmer, lived in abject uh, poverty, uh, given a sentence of 300 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the individuals started to plead. Uh, people were tried and convicted. Those who pl pled uh, got fewer years but still long sentences. Uh, we got involved in that case along with uh, some local lawyers in Texas, and we brought in some law firms coordinated uh, post-conviction strategy and got all of these sentences overturned and these individuals released last uh, last August. Uh, but now we're bringing, um, oh, we're trying to resolve a damages suit and we're close to resolving that. I think we'll get a good resolution mm -hmm. as of this date. Uh, we're very close. Uh, but that, that, that reflects how our criminal justice system works in many instances. Most people in this country certainly most white Americans, but even many black folk think that the majority of crack users uh, are black. They are not. The majority of the people who use crack cocaine in this country are white, but 90 percent of those who are in jail are, are black. Now, the point is not to say we want equal, uh, uh, kind of equal imprisonment, mm. uh, equal opportunity incarceration. Yeah. The point is to look at this system and ask why does it operate the way it does and bring some more sense to our drug policies to stock our prisons with young black people, uh, many of them innocent, but some of them have been involved in drugs, but who have drug addiction problems. Uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And then we have the, the uh, consequences of incarceration, felony convictions, and people who are not allowed to vote People are not allowed to pursue uh, an education because they can't get federally backed loans. They can't get uh, federally subsidized housing or public housing. They can't get jobs. I mean, we're turning a whole is it generation. Your, is it your position that felons should be allowed to vote? Oh, yes. Why? Because you commit a crime, you do the time. Mm -hmm. That's the debt you pay to society. Uh, but to take people and separate them from society. And to say that they are civically dead, that they have no right to participate in society, uh, that is a penalty that goes beyond that which is provided for statutorily. And even where a legislature decides to do that, it's bad policy. We've got to bring people back into society, completely rehabilitated, uh, to say, okay, you made a mistake, you did this, it's wrong, you paid your debt, now you come and you participate. Well, this happens to white collar criminals all the time. Well, we don't see a whole lot of white collar, you mean in terms of being brought back in? Yeah. Oh, yes, that that's right, that's right. Now, what I want to ask you is, how does LDF make the decision as to which cases it's going to litigate? Because every day, with 35 million black folks in this country, something goes wrong and bad for black folks that shouldn't happen. So how do you make your decision as to what you litigate? You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very um, painful process sometimes because we know that there are so many people out there who uh, need help and we can only reach a small portion of them. So therefore, we take what we call impact cases, cases that involve either large numbers of plaintiffs, class actions, or cases that involve a, an issue of law that once it's decided is going to have broad application. Now, because how we want to get the most bang the for the buck. How the case, because I know about that case and I congratulate you on it, how did you make the decision to do that? Well, there are some cases that just, you know, cry out for attention. I mean, mm -hmm. here you have, uh, as I said, uh, about a tenth of the tiny town's black population arrested and prosecuted, and the way it was done. Uh, was uh, just such a severe injustice 
when it came to our attention because uh, some local activists and some people in the national scene uh, were talking about the case, and uh, Deborah Smalls in particular, who worked for the t at the time with the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, let us know about this case. And we said, this is a case that we just have mm -hmm. to do. We had represented Kemba Smith, a young black co-ed from Hampton, who got caught up with a boyfriend who had turned out to be a drug dealer, even though she didn't sell, use, or handle drugs. She's convicted and sent to prison for 24 years after he was killed, and they made her the drug kingpin for prosecutorial purposes. Well, we represented her, so we knew that this was an issue. We got her a pardon mm -hmm. by President Clinton just before he left office, but this was an issue that we came into and that we're going to be with for a long time. Let me just mention the four areas that answer your question. We have four areas in which we try to focus, uh, given that we try to do impact litigation. Education remains and will continue to be one of our biggest, biggest problems and our biggest areas. Uh, years, decades spent on school desegregation, educational improvement. The era of school desegregation is all but over. We still have to improve public schools, even if America has tolerated resegregation. Are so you involved in some of the financial equity suits? We have not been involved with the pure financial equity suits, although many of the school desegregation cases have brought about financial equity mm -hmm. results, and mm -hmm. we've used them as leverage to get mm -hmm. those kinds of results where we can. Uh, but we're very supportive of those who are litigating those cases. Uh, we've also, because somebody has to do the race yeah. discrimination cases, yeah. and that's what we do. Yeah. Uh, we've also done uh, cases and continue to do cases in voting rights, political participation. Mm -hmm. So that's the second area. The third area I've talked about is criminal justice. And the fourth area is economic development, which encompasses our uh, employment discrimination docket, but goes beyond that to address problems like redlining, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and other issues which retard the economic development of the African-American community and communities of color. What about affirmative action? Affirmative action. Because that's education and employment and housing and a lot it's of It's everything. It's everything. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's everything, because affirmative action in its purest form, when you bring it down to simplicity, is simply consciously and voluntarily doing something about racial inequality. Now, because of the way the discourse on race in this country plays out, uh, people distort what the affirmative action debate is about. A lot of people don't understand it. Uh, a lot of people in this country think either we are colorblind or we should be colorblind. Uh, and the, the far right, the radical conservatives, have appropriated the language of the civil rights movement. So they use color, colorblindness as a Trojan horse now mm -hmm. uh, to carry their agenda, which is to make it illegal to consciously and voluntarily do anything about racial inequality. Because they argue that as soon as you begin to address racial inequality in a targeted way, if you have targeted programs, scholarship programs for African Americans, pipeline programs, mentoring programs, any programs targeted at African Americans, that is racially discriminatory uh, and white people are the victims. Well, that assumes that there's some kind of, of, of equation uh, between invidious discrimination motivated by notions of racial subordination, uh, racial inferiority, that animated the, the segregation era and slavery, and affirmative action, which is not based upon notions of racial inferiority. It's simply trying to include people. Mm -hmm. It's not discriminatory. They try to make it the same. And it's important that people understand this result because as important as the Michigan cases were, there's a bigger storm brewing, and it is exactly around this question of whether it's going to be legal to do something consciously and voluntarily in a targeted way about racial inequality. Well, obviously, reparations gets right to that. Uh, are you folks going to take on any of the reparations cases? We, you know, the, the reparations cases are being litigated by uh, a group of lawyers and law firms who are used to doing litigation in which they recover big fees. We've consulted with them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the, the group, a second group, uh, or the first, I'm not trying to say one has primacy over the other, but Charles Ogletree and yeah. others, uh, mm -hmm. they're uh, doing litigation right now uh, in Tulsa, arising out of the Tulsa yeah. uh, riots uh, uh, decades ago. And, and we wish them well. We do consult with them. There may come a point in which we file an amicus brief. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, you know, those cases were covered 
and we want to see them do well. On the other hand, somebody has to keep steady on the affirmative action cases, on the race discrimination cases that are still in the pipeline. There's a, there's a lot of resistance to the cases that we've been doing over the years, so you know there's going to be a great deal of resistance to the reparations cases. Uh, they raise issues obviously arising out of the same experience, uh, and so we have to be uh, involved in at least talking to the folks who are doing these cases, and we've done some of that. Well, as the director counsel designee, I know the Legal Defense Fund is under good hands. Uh, you have been on the forefront of many of these issues. We've worked together. And I just want to thank you for coming and sharing with us on today's African American Legends, both the history of the Legal Defense Fund, some of the things that you do, and where you're going in the future, because we need you. Thank you, and we need all the support we can get. We're a 501c3, and you know what that means. Okay, very good. Thank okay. you very much, Ted Shaw. Thank you.